Hey y'all, it's Brittany and welcome back. I am back with another installment of Makeup and Murder. And this week's story is all about Beth Doe, who we now know is Evelyn Colon. Now, Miss Colon has been missing for over 40 years and she's finally been identified and we finally have a prime suspect, y'all. So if y'all wanna hear about the story of Beth Doe, everything that happened to her, then stay tuned. All right, y'all, so let's jump right into the story of Beth Doe. And we'll start off the story as Beth Doe, and then we'll find out, you know, as we go through the story, who she really is, who her family is, and what really happened to our Beth Doe. Now, for those of you who are just finding my channel, welcome, welcome, welcome. We have a lot of fun on this channel, so make sure you subscribe, make sure you hit that notification bell, and make sure you like the video at the end in the middle whenever you feel like hitting that like button it's fine with me okay and for those of you who have already subscribed welcome back thank you for being a part of my family we've seen tremendous growth in these last couple of weeks and i'm so excited for the things to come so thank you thank you thank you but let's hop into this story i'm just gonna throw on my fenty matte primer And then I am going to control my brows with this Kush Brow Gel from Milk Makeup. Now, the story of Beth Doe really begins on December 20th, 1976. And what happens is there is a 14 year old boy who is just walking through the nearby woods and the riverbank um, near his home. And it's something that he would do frequently. He would frequently just walk through the area, kind of that was his playground, and that, that was what he did. So one day he was just walking through the area as always. He had just been there the week before and everything was, you know, normal as they expected. And he's walking through the area and he sees something on the riverbank and what it ends up being as he, you know, gets closer and approaches it and sees what he sees, it's a suitcase that had parts of a body in it. So from what he saw, there was a female's head, her upper torso, her thighs, upper thighs, and also there was a, there was also a fetus, a nine month old fetus there as well so he had his older brother come to the area you know make sure what their what he thought he was saying was real of course it was and they ended up immediately calling the police so when the police arrive and they start to kind of canvas the area around where the suitcase was actually found with the pieces of our Beth Doe they find in the nearby woods that's really close to the riverbank, they find two other suitcases. So there are a total of three suitcases that are found. So of the three luggages that they found, two of them were red, white, and blue. And those were the ones that were found in the woods. And there was a third luggage, the one that was found on the riverbank. And that one was tan on kind of like the outside. So it was like a leather border on the outside and then kind of the middle of the suitcase was like a blue plaid pattern and all three of these suitcases had like black spray paint in different areas on them kind of in random places on the suitcases and all of them also had the handles cut off of the suitcases now going and doing my research a lot of people thought it was for one of two things it was either so that whoever found these suitcases could not easily open them or back then, and I don't know if it's still practiced today, but back then what was said was that when stores had merchandise that didn't sell, they would, of course, they would toss it, but when they tossed it, they would damage it in such a way that dumpster divers could not get like good product from the store just by dumpster diving versus actually shopping in the store. Now, I feel like these days we have things like um, outlet stores and things like that so that when stores can't sell product they'll 
they can give it to a third party who will sell it and pay them a portion j just for buying it from them. But I think back then in the 70s, that was kind of like their approach. They would damage the goods so that no dumpster divers could get good products for free. So one or two reasons for why it was damaged. Either the killer didn't want you to open it easily or it was just something that they found in a trash that was damaged by a store. Um, but that is the condition that those were found in. I am tired of my brow pencil right now, so I am actually going to use my Brow by Rima Brow Kit. It never fails me. The powders are bomb. Everything else is okay in this kit, but the powders, the brow powders are bomb. So her hands, her feet, and the lower parts of her legs were found in the suitcases that were found in the woods. And then, like I said before, her head, upper torso, her thighs and the nine month old fetus that she was carrying because she was pregnant at the time of her death, they were all in the suitcase that was found on the river bank. So knowing that and knowing the area, the police kind of assume that whoever the killer was probably threw these suitcases off of the bridge that was right near the area. And the goal was probably to have those suitcases land in the water and then have the, the water kind of just transport them to wherever. But his aim must have been really bad because they landed on the riverbank and then another one landed or ended up in the nearby woods. So I don't know where he was aiming those suitcases. It's hard to miss a big body of water with some suitcase. I don't know. They didn't make it into the water. Another thing that police found when they found the kind of the body parts, they found that they were wrapped in newspaper. So they were all like individually wrapped in newspaper and then they were also wrapped in like a chenille blanket, but it was like a ripped up chenille blanket. So the killer was kind of just using whatever he or she had at the time to kind of like conceal what was in the luggage. There was also like packing foam and straw. It was just, it was a hot mess in that luggage. Now, when they closely examine the torso um, and the other body parts, they find that her nose, her ears, and her breasts were all cut away from her body and removed and they were never found. And they also found that she could, they could tell that she was beaten, she was assaulted, and they also could tell that she was shot in the neck. Thinking about, you know, things that happen to victims and the stories that I talk about and tell, this is probably one of the worst conditions that I've, I could say that I've heard a body being in um, for a single person. So it also makes me feel like the way that she was killed and everything that was done to her body, it was out of passion, out of anger, somebody very close to her because it's definitely overkill. Now I'm just gonna take a little bit of my NARS concealer and clean up the brows. We don't want them looking this thick, y'all. So about three days later, they complete their first autopsy on Beth Doe. They find that she was killed by strangulation and then they also find that she was shot in the neck, but she was shot in the neck after she had already died from strangulation. She was also assaulted and she was also sexually assaulted before her death as well. So this definitely had to be, like I said, it just feels like it was a crime of passion. It feels like it was somebody that was really close to her that committed this atrocious crime. They also find out that she is most likely a Caucasian female between the height of 4'11 and 5'4. It was kind of hard to tell with her being dismembered. And she had dark brown hair, brown eyes, dark brown eyes. And they thought that she may have been of uh, some type of Mediterranean dis descent. She also had two moles that would be helpful to identify on her face. She had two scars on her left leg, one above the heel, which was like five inches long, and then one above the calf, which was about two inches long. So she had some good solid identifiers on her body that would help to easily 
identify her, but the trouble was trying to figure out who she was in the first place to be able to identify and link her to her family. That was the real feat for investigators. Now I'm just gonna take a little bit of my Born This Way concealer and color correct. This is mahogany. They also sent her dental impressions and her fingerprints uh, into the FBI and the FBI tried to check all their national databases and they checked within the US and within Canada and there was no match. All right, so I'm going to be trying out the new Kat Von D Vegan Beauty Good Apple Skin Perfecting Foundation Balm. We'll see how it goes. I'm not too sure about this color match because it just felt so limited in my undertone, which I have a pink undertone. So we'll see. Now I'm gonna take my Dose of Colors concealer and brighten and say a prayer. Finally, a year later, the police were able to identify the newspaper that her body parts had been wrapped in. It was the New York Sunday newspaper and that newspaper was distributed throughout the nor northern part of New Jersey. The date of the newspaper was from September 26th of 1976. Somewhat helpful, but not completely. So after they're able to identify the newspaper, they don't really have any other leads. So a couple years later in August of 1983, the police decided to bury Beth Doe and her unborn daughter in a potter's field that is basically kind of a cemetery for unidentified people, unclaimed people, that kind of thing. I'm gonna take just a bit of my Becca, which is a shade lighter than my Dose of Colors. This is almond. And I'm just gonna put a tiny dot to brighten right at the eye. And now I'm taking my Fenty Beauty Skin Stick Caviar and I'm going to do a little bit of contouring. I'm trying to make sure to do my creams first and then set it all with powder at the same time. Instead of doing cream set with powder, put some more cream set with powder, y'all know. So the case goes cold for years, 21 years the case goes cold. And then finally in 2004, the case is reassigned to a cold case squad. In 2007, they decide to go ahead and exhume her body because they feel like DNA and technology has made such advances and updates since they originally um, investigated her case and ran tests on her tissue and all of that stuff. So they wanted to do kind of a reassessment of her remains to see if they could, you know, get a second stab at identifying who Beth Doe actually was. So they exhume her body and they send her DNA off to actually be tested and then also to get an updated sketch of what Beth Doe would actually look like based on her actual DNA, not just based on the remains that they found. But ultimately, even that results in no leads, no updates, no matches in any type of databases once they run the analysis on the DNA and also once they get the updated sketch. However, luckily it does help to eliminate missing women from the list of people that they need to identify. So although they could not necessarily say for sure that it was someone, they could identify who it wasn't based on other DNA analysis that they already had done. And now I'm gonna set my under eye with my Laura Mercier translucent powder and then I'm gonna set the rest of my face because it's all cream, it's all a balm, it's all something that's not powder. So I'm going to set it with my deep, more skin-like Laura Mercier. So, finally in 2015, the National Center for Missing Children creates a new updated version of what they think Beth Doe would look like at this age that she's currently at in 2015. And 
they're hoping that maybe that being more realistic to now, if someone's seen her, it may lead to some identification, a family member kind of identifying her, something. But unfortunately, it still leads to nothing. Something that I forgot to mention in 2014, they also ran some special testing on her tissue and it was isotope testing. And isotope testing, what it did was it allowed them to use her tissue to kind of determine, you know, who she was, where she was from, where she lived, where the baby was conceived. From the isotopes, they said that she was most likely of um, European, she came from like a European country, most likely somewhere in Serbia or Croatia, somewhere like that. And then they also mentioned that she had been in the U.S. for five or 10 years and she was about 20 years old. She lived in the southeast portion of the country. Specifically, they thought she was living in Tennessee. And the infant was conceived in the northeast area of the country as well. So a lot of details were received from that isotope analysis. But unfortunately, like I said, it still didn't lead to any leads. So then in 2019 is when they, the police received a tip saying that they knew who this missing person was. They knew who Beth Doe was and that she was a missing foster care child who ran away from her foster home in 1974. Her name was Madeline Cruz. They called her Maddie. And they said she ran away from her foster care home and she... Uh, was missing for two years from the foster care home. And then out of the blue, she called a friend in 1976 and said, hey, I'm pregnant. I need money. Can you help me out? And then she kind of disappeared into thin air again. So they said that that's who that person was. It looked like her. And come to find out, unfortunately, that it was not Maggie. Maggie had been found alive and well by police. So it was not Maggie Cruz that was our Beth Doe. But after that, you started to get those kind of conspiracy theories popping up or you get those, this was an honor killing because of the dismemberment and things like that and the removal of body parts that were never found with the dismembered pieces. So you start to get all those kind of stories kind of cropping up as it becomes more of a cold case and it becomes something that police just can't seem to get the break that they need for Beth Doe. In 2020, police and investigators decide, okay, let's send a portion of her femur to a lab in Texas and let's see what they can do with it. So they sent the piece of femur and tissue um, for analysis. And wouldn't you know, they get a hit of a family relative's DNA. Interestingly enough, the relative's DNA is not DNA because he was some criminal or, you know, he was in, and we, we were forcibly given his DNA. It wasn't anything like that. He actually has sent his DNA to a number of different like genealogy sites, like the 23andMe sites, or, you know, those sites where you like swab your mouth just to see who is related to you, who's in your family tree. So we'll find out that he actually did that to see if he could find his missing aunt. And we'll talk more about his family in a second and who this person is, but that is how they end up identifying Beth Doe and her family and who she really is. And I thought that was like so awesome. I feel like there's a conversation that goes back and forth about, should we be using that DNA from these sites, people that are just submitting DNA to find out who they're related to? Should we really be using that DNA to solve crimes? And, you know, some people say yes. Some people say that once you submit that DNA to a site, 
you kind of open yourself up for any type of use when you set when you submit that. Other people feel like no, it's an invasion of privacy, that kind of thing. You it shouldn't be that that's like a fine line that shouldn't be crossed where you're doing it for one reason and then police hop into it and now, you know, you're being charged with a crime or somebody in your family is being caught, but I feel like why not? I feel like y'all should just throw a little clause in there when you um, you 23andMe people and other DNA tests that y'all have out there, throw a little clause in there saying, look, we're going to find out who's in your family tree. But also, we're going to find out if you got murderers in your family tree. We're going to find out if you got rapists in your family tree. We're going to find out if you have any type of criminal in your family tree or you're a criminal yourself in your family tree. We're going to find all of this out. So just so you know, it's going to happen. So... I feel like that is a great way to solve all these cold cases, to be able to like trace family members through the DNA that they willingly submit and they're not criminals, but they're willingly su submitting the DNA or providing the DNA. It's a, it's a whole new database and a whole new world that kind of opens up in terms of helping to solve cold cases. So I just thought that was awesome. So through him submitting to these kind of genealogy sites, we find out that our Beth Doe has a name and she's not as old as what we thought she was. She's not even from where they thought she was. And it's just so sad to learn the real story of Evelyn Colon. Now, the hero of this story, y'all, as I bronze with my revolution glow in deep, is Evelyn Colon's nephew, her brother is his father, and his name is Luis Colon Jr. And like I mentioned earlier, he just thought it would be a good idea. Why not? You know, my aunt's been missing for a while now, and it would just, we, we think she's alive, and we think she's just doing her own thing, but why not? If we can find her through this, then why not submit my DNA to a couple different sites and see what, you know, pops from it? And by doing that, police reached out to him because they got a hit from the DNA. And they called him and they said, hey, you know, we have a relative who died from homicide and we want to know if you have anybody that's missing in your family, if, you know, there's anybody that died in your family or, you know, you never heard of, heard from in a while. And he said, you know, yeah, we, I have an aunt that went missing in the 70s. And, you know, we just thought she wanted to go do her own thing, live her own life. And we haven't heard from her since. And his father, who was still alive, her brother, he was able to confirm that, yes, that description matched. Yes, at the time when we, when she left us, she was pregnant. So they knew that she was expecting. And the sad part about all of this is that she was pregnant, she was expecting, his sister was 15 years old. Evelyn Cologne was 15 years old, pregnant, when she went missing. I'm also taking my bronzer to shake my nose a little bit. Her family says that she was last seen in New Jersey, in Jersey City, New Jersey. And he also remembers who her boyfriend was, who she was living with in Jersey City, New Jersey, when she just disappeared. And his name was Luis Sierra. Now, Luis Sierra, at the time, when she was 15, he was 19 years old. And obviously, the family said it was just, you know, a different time back then when, you know, no matter what age you were, when you got pregnant, when you got somebody pregnant, y'all moved out together, y'all established y'all life together, and that's just what it was. So now, these days, it is very strange to have a 15-year-old move out with her 19-year-old boyfriend and the family just be okay with that. That it's not an everyday occurrence these days at, by any means. But back then, that's what you did. When you started a family, whether it was on accident or not, you took care of your family. You, you became the head of that household and y'all established a household together. So she was living with her 19-year-old boyfriend at the time when she was miss, went missing. And she was pregnant with his child at that time as well. Her sister also remembered something that was very important at the time in the investigation. So her sister recalled that right before she went missing, 
her mother got a call from Evelyn and Evelyn said, you know, mom, I'm not feeling well. Can you bring me some soup to make me feel better? You know, everybody, I call my mom all the time when I'm sick, when I'm super sick and it's just not feeling, I'm not feeling hot at all. I call my mom, my mom brings over some chicken noodle soup and some crackers. She knows just what to bring me. I don't do it often, but when I, you know, I'm married, I got a husband who can do that too, but he's busy. If I'm sick, he has to take care of the kids and he's working a full-time job too. So I always call my mom for comfort. So I completely get it. I completely understand that whole situation. So of course, mom, you know, made some soup, got ready to go over there to the apartment in Jersey City where Evelyn and Luis were living together. And she gets there and the apartment is empty. A, no one's home. B, it's completely cleared out. But you just called me and said you were sick. I'm going to lay down a little bit of powder under my eyes so that I can do my eyeshadow real quick. Real simple, nothing crazy, y'all. And I am going to use my Natasha Denona Ayana palette. And this is like a neutral brownish kind of palette. And I'm also going to be using my Masquerade Mini by Juvia's Place. So... Once that happened, they really just assumed that her and Louise had kind of went, gone off to do their own thing. The reason they kind of felt that way was because they asked the neighbors in the area and they said, oh, they moved away. They moved to, you know, somewhere else. They just moved. So without anything else to go on, any other reason to think that something bad happened, um, they, you know, thought the best and they just said, hey, okay, maybe they just moved away to start a new life. So they never ever filed her as missing. There was no missing persons report filed. Um, and I feel like never, I'm never going to ever blame the family, but I feel like there were some signs because the family knew that Luis was abusive to Evelyn. He was an abusive boyfriend. He was extremely jealous and he would literally lock her in the apartment so she could go nowhere, do nothing, have any, have no friends. And y'all know those signs when there is abuse going on. Even if you're not sure, when you see someone starting to be isolated by their significant other from their family, from their friends, they can't do anything. They can't go anywhere. Something's wrong. Something is up and something is wrong. So always be on the lookout for those red flags from your family members, from your friends, from even people. You ain't got to like them. But if you notice them flags, check on your people. About a year later, the family says that they got a letter from someone. They didn't know who it was from. It was supposed to, I guess, look like it was from Evelyn, but the family kind of knew that it wasn't from Evelyn because Evelyn didn't know how to write. She couldn't write. So it was a letter that was in Spanish. And mind you, I do want to point out that the earlier research in earlier years kind of said that she was either European or Caucasian and from like Croatia or Serbia. Her family was from Puerto Rico. So the letter was in Spanish and it was written and it basically just says, you know, Evelyn and the baby are doing fine. There's nothing to worry about here. Uh, just kind of living our own lives, making our own way. If we need something from you, the family, then we'll reach out. Otherwise, don't contact us, basically. And then it also went on to say, you know, she had a, you know, oh, healthy nine pound baby boy. Now we know that the fetus was a girl. And we also know that that baby was never born to know what the sex was. And now with knowing what they know, they know that Luis Sierra is the boyfriend. They know that that is who she was having a baby with. That is who she lived with. That could be a potential suspect. They are instantly searching for Luis Sierra. And they actually find him. It didn't take too much to find him, but they find him in Ozone Park, New York. Okay, so I just did a quick cut crease with just my Dose of Colors um, concealer. But 
when police go to talk to Luis Sierra, initially he tries to deny that he even knew Evelyn Cologne at all. And the police already know the full story behind their relationship. He know They know that Evelyn was pregnant with his baby. They know that they were sharing an apartment together in Jersey City. So he can lie all he wants to, but the police are not going to let him get away with it. So eventually he finally admits that, yes, he knew Evelyn Cologne. Yes, they were dating. Yes, they did live together. Yes, she was pregnant with his baby. But then he goes on to lie more. He says, you know, yeah, we were together, but she, you know, just disappeared on me. The last time I saw her was in the apartment and I was leaving to go to work and she was there when I left. And then when I came home, she was gone. And, you know, I thought she went to go live with her dad. So that's what he said to police. And of course the police did not buy it. He didn't bother to look for her. He didn't file a missing person report. He didn't even care to check on his child. He knew that she was pregnant and it was almost her delivery date. Didn't bother to even check on his child. All right guys, now it's time to throw on a little bit of blush. And I am using my MAC blush. This is the Rosie Does It of their Glow Play blush line. I am going to use my Becca Chocolate Geode Highlighter. And then I'm gonna take my NYX lip liner. This is Auburn. And I am going to use my Huda Beauty Demi Matte in Feminist. So with her now being identified and found, the family was finally able to add a name stone to the resting place that was at the um, original Potter's Field. And they were able to add, you know, Evelyn Cologne right underneath the cross that read Beth Doe. And I just feel so much for that family. I feel like they got so much closure. They were always living thinking, you know, where is she? She said, you know, all those years ago, she said she kind of just wanted to live her own life and they missed her. They were one of five, she was one of five children. So she missed out on a lot, nieces, nephews, her parents, all of that stuff. So for the family to finally be able to have some closure and to know where Evelyn is, is amazing. I know it's not the answer or the closure that they wanted. They wanted to find her alive and well with children and a family, but unfortunately it just wasn't the case, but at least some closure was received. Unfortunately, they only have one photo and if you look it up online, there's a very, very grainy photo of Evelyn Cologne. That is the only photo that the family has left in 1975. Their family suffered a tragic, tragic fire that burned all of their family mementos and photos and all of that kind of stuff. So they were really left with just one photo and they've been asking, you know, if anyone has any images, friends, extended family, and any images at all of Evelyn to share them with them. Also, they set up a GoFundMe page as well. And the GoFundMe page was, it's I think it's still up. Um, so if you wanted to, to you know, donate, check it out. But they set up a GoFundMe page so that they could have a memorial for Evelyn as well. Now, just a couple days ago, this all is so brand new. It just hit, you know, my updates for me. But on March 30th of this year was when Luis Sierra was finally arrested and named the prime suspect of the murder of Evelyn Cologne. So right now they've charged him with one count of um, homicide or murder, criminal homicide. And that's what they're moving forward with. I do truly hope that they also charge him with the murder of his own baby girl that he ripped from his poor girlfriend's body. I, I want to see him get all of his just desserts. Okay. I will keep tracking this story to see the developments in the trial. He is being held with no bond. He cannot get out. He's 63 years old now. So he doesn't have much life left to live anyway, but justice is justice. So 
I am tracking this story. I hope that the family gets all the justice that they deserve for both Evelyn and the little baby that they named Emily Grace. Such a beautiful name. But at least these people, these missing people, the Beth Doe and the baby Doe have names now. They have family, they have meaning. So that's what's most important here. Now we're going to spray the face with my Milani Make It Last matte spray. Yes, I do the most with my spray, okay? So that is the case of Beth Doe, who we now know is Evelyn Cologne. And like I said before, I'm just grateful that the family got some form of closure. I'm grateful that two people that were previously unidentified, yes, I said two people, were, you know, finally identified, given, you know, some recognition, names were said, because that's what's important for these victims identify these people they were people they were worth living no one person it should be able to decide who lives and who dies that's my ted talk thanks for coming this is also the look i like this look y'all as y'all know i've been on this you know ombre kind of lip journey I just wanted to be a little spicy today. So I did a little bit of a smoky kind of cut crease and I wanted to, you know, give myself a little bit of a pop in the lip area. So I like it. And I didn't feel like doing my hair today. So sis, I popped on a cute little wig with a little bit of movement and a cute little turban because I was not about to secure it today. I just, I'm not in the mood. It's raining, it's cloudy, I'm not in the mood. So it's still cute. This is one of my favorite kind of go-to looks when I don't feel like doing my hair. Looks just as good. But you guys let me know in the comments below what you think of this week's story of Beth Doe, AKA Evelyn Cologne. I enjoyed making today's video. I enjoyed the look. I enjoyed sharing a true crime story that is actually very, very recent. Like I said, they arrested him within the last week. So I hope you enjoyed the story. I hope you enjoyed today's look and hop in the comments. Let me know your thoughts, y'all. Also, if you have not subscribed already, make sure you subscribe. You don't wanna miss the true crime stories that I have or the looks that I have to give. And finally, just like the video. It means so much to me and my channel. It helps me continue to grow. I have seen crazy growth, at least for me, it's crazy um, in the last couple of weeks. It's just been awesome. So thank you guys for those of you who continuously watch, who you know come back every week to see what I got going on. Thank you guys so much. It truly means the world to me. So until next time, which should be next week, it's been real. It's been fun. I love you guys. Bye. She cute.